Is anybody here glad that you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Are you happy about that? Amen. There's nothing more important than knowing him. Now, I'm not going to keep you long tonight unless I'm supposed to. <laughs> that's, that's a different thing altogether, isn't it? Last Sunday night, you remember, we were uh, in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. I want to go back there for a few minutes and finish up what I didn't uh, get a chance to do last week. And uh, I just want to reiterate a little bit. One of the main points that I, I wanted you to see last week was this, and that is that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. But we cannot, and sometimes we, we look at this and think, well, spiritual blessings. But we cannot separate spiritual blessings from your body, your house you live in. Because anything that comes from God that is a blessing to you will affect you in the natural. As a matter of fact, if God has blessed you with all spiritual blessings and it didn't affect you outwardly, I wonder if you got them at all. Amen? Because what happens inwardly will show outwardly. It'll change you on the outside. And when it changes on the outside, it changes the way you walk, the way you talk, how you respond and react to situations. And God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Anything, and, and, and we're told as well that he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So your everyday life and your spiritual walk are intertwined and linked together. And when you try to separate them, you get in trouble. It's as if, you know, we live our spiritual life somewhere else, but it should not be influential or effective in our natural life. It can't be that way. It has to be intertwined because you are a triune being. You are a spirit. You have a soul, which includes your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you live in a physical body. Uh, most of the time, you're not separated from your physical body. Have you noticed that? When was the last time you got up in the morning and left your body in bed? As a matter of fact, if you, if you got up and left your body in bed and came to church, we wouldn't know you were here. So if you want to be influential, if you want to be effective, you have to bring your body. And that's how it works in this life. Your spirit is in a natural body, and we're blessed with all spiritual blessings, and it is, it is a, a link. Paul the Apostle was changed dramatically on the road to Damascus. And when God met with him and made available to him the blessings that came through the cross, when Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, it meant that he accepted what Jesus had offered him and it changed him from the inside out. And Paul the persecutor became Paul the preacher. Who, who changed uh, cities and nations for the kingdom of God. And he still, through his writings, half the New Testament pretty much was written by the Apostle Paul, and he's still changing uh, the world today because it changed him on the outside, the spiritual blessings. So, so, so we're, all, we're blessed with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, hath its done deal blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And uh, he has chosen us in him. And I mentioned the fact that he has chosen us to be holy. He chose us to be without blame and faultless. And we won't go into the other scriptures that indicate there's a responsibility on our part to, to work with that. And I gave you some scriptures there, but we won't go into them tonight. And he chose us to be in Christ and before him uh, in God the Father. So we, uh, we want to just continue and go into the last part of that chapter, and I believe that God wants to speak to our hearts from some of these things. Uh, 
I'm going to start with verse 6 and just continue on down through the... Well, let's just read verse 5. He has predestinated us onto the adoption of children. He has predetermined that, that the body of Christ would be God's adopted children. Stop and think about that for a moment. God has predecided that we would be a part of his family, totally and completely accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ into his family because he really wanted to do that. The Bible says it was because of the, the goodwill of his pleasure. In other words, it was something he wanted to do. And, and that we should be to the praise of his glory and the praise of the glory of his grace. In whom, verse 7, we have redemption through the blood of the Lord Jesus, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The same grace that has brought us redemption through the blood of Christ. That, that grace is, we're supposed to be praising and honoring God for that grace. In verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, we don't use that word prudence a lot, but it basically means mental activity or insight. It's, it, it's, it's a, uh, the ability to actually let wisdom work through you and through your mind. And uh, it said in verse 8, he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. In other words, he has abounded to you and I so that his wisdom is in our hearts and in our minds we're able to, to have his wisdom expanded so that it makes a difference in our everyday life and decisions. Do you know the Christian, the believer, should, should be ahead when it comes to making decisions and quality decisions about their life and w what they're going to do, where they're going to be. God's plan is for you and I to be smarter because of his presence. I want you to think about that for a moment. He never intended for you or me to be ever caught off guard. In other words, because of his wisdom and his prudence in our lives, we, we get a witness on the inside, and we have, we have understanding to be able to apply his wisdom to our everyday activities. Just think about that for a moment. If we would be more sensitive to what God is trying to do in our lives, he could direct us into paths that are actually bringing blessing physically, mentally, spiritually, materially, financially, socially, whatever area of life you, you desire help in, you need to be asking God to help you in that area. We sometimes, we sometimes forfeit what is available to us because we don't take the time to inquire of the Lord and ask for his wisdom and his guidance. And, and God says that this, this has abounded towards us. I mean, the wisdom and, 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 and the, the prudence of God, the, 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 the mental activity and total insight that can only come by the blessing and the presence of God in your life, it's, it's abounding to us. So why wouldn't, we, why wouldn't we praise and honor him and thank him for his grace? You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I really don't have a whole lot of wisdom. Well, God wants to be made unto us wisdom. Amen? And you know, in James 1 and 5, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, there's, there's no excuse for being uh, deficient in wisdom. If we lack wisdom, the Word of God says emphatically in James 1 and 5, if any of you, that, that, means, that means you, it means me. Just think about it. There's nobody in this place tonight. Well, I don't know how. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have any insight. If any of you lack wisdom, if any of you, you get that? If any of you lack wisdom, that means you. Everybody say, that means me. So say, th say this after me. If I lack wisdom, I'm supposed to ask God. And when I ask God, say it. I'm supposed to believe that I get it. Isn't that what James said? He said, ask in faith, nothing doubting. 
For he that doubteth will receive nothing from the Lord. So there is a prerequisite. We come, we ask, and we expect that God's wisdom is being imparted to us. And I'm going to know what to say. I'm going to know what to do. I'm going to know exactly what I'm supposed to do and where I'm supposed to go in my particular situation. Somebody say amen. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. So if we ask for wisdom, what are we going to do? Ask him for it. Ask him for it. If any, any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. And he giveth to all men liberally. In verse 9 it says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Sometimes people get so caught up in wondering what is the will of God. Will of God is a simple thing. Read the Bible. He made it clear what his will was. I mean, God's will is that people be saved. God is, God's will is that people be healed. God's will is that people be blessed. The scriptures are abundant in these areas. God's will is that none be lost. Now we need to understand, and we can, when we study the Bible, we find out that, that God's will is not always being done. Some people think, well, if God wants it, it's going to happen. Well, the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but uh, if you've studied the word, you know emphatically that the Bible is clear that many will be lost. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Broad is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in. It is abundantly clear that there's a lot of people going to reject and totally walk away from what God is offering. But uh, we know his will is that the whole world be saved. That's where the doctrine of universalism comes from. In other words, we, some people believe that eventually everybody's going to save. I heard talk, somebody talking about it a while ago. Well, even Hitler is going to be saved. I doubt it very much. <laughs> I mean, unless he repented before he just slipped out of here. And uh, we, we, we leave that stuff with the Lord. But, you know, in some cases we have testimony left behind of people, uh, what, they de what they decided, what, what, what came out of their decision-making process and was clear to everybody they left behind where they stood. But the Word of God is abundantly clear that He wants that we would be born again, that we would be saved. In 2 Peter 3 and 9, this is just one scripture, and there are a whole lot of others we could look at. We won't do that tonight. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is, is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but he wants that all should come to repentance. Amen? You say, well, what's his will for my life? Well, you know, there's, there's a responsibility on our part to, to begin to ask God about these things and then to, to honor him and, and, and put him in first place so that his will can be done. Because his will is not just going to be automatically done in your life. The word says that if, if we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding, in all our ways acknowledge him. And what's he going to do? He's going to direct our path. The implied converse of that is that if you don't trust him, and you don't lean on him instead of your own understanding. And if you don't acknowledge him in your ways, that he's not going to be the one directing your path. You probably will be directing your own path. and you direct your own path, you're going to get out of the will of God. Amen? You know, uh, we need the kingdom of God to come on the inside of us so that his will can be done. And until you receive... God's kingdom, which is the word of God being implemented in your life on a regular basis, 
uh, until we receive his kingdom established in our hearts, then the will of God is not going to be done. Jesus said that we're to pray that his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let his kingdom come in my mind, in my heart, in my life. Let his kingdom come in your mind, in your heart, in your life. Let his kingdom come so that his will can be done. You know, if his will was going to be done automatically and, and there was nothing we had to do about it, Jesus wouldn't have taught his disciples to pray that way. Pray that his kingdom come and that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, there are other scriptures we could go into about that, but I just want to throw that out so you can study it yourself and find the scriptures that make it clear that God wants us to put him first. And to welcome him and his ways and his ideas, his truth into our lives so that his will will be done. Amen? God wants you to find the path that he's marked out for you. He wants you and I to make quality decisions that allows him to bring blessing into your life whereas the enemy wants to bring cursing. The enemy wants to bring defeat. The enemy wants to bring every kind of heartache and trouble. But the word of God is clear that God wants to bless you coming in and bless you going out to make you the head and not the tail, to cause you to be above only and not beneath. That's the will of God. That's God's desire. And you know, in Colossians 1.27, again, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And of course, in verse 9, we just read, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. And then in Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is... What is that which is made known. It is Christ in you, Christ in me, which is my hope of glory. If we're ever going to share in the glory of God, we're going to see him and, and rule and reign with him as the word of God implies, then we need to make sure that Christ is on the inside of us and we need to be completely um, persuaded like Paul said to Timothy, you know, persuaded that God is able to keep what you commit to him against that day. And when you are completely persuaded that Christ is in you, that is your hope of glory. Amen? In Ephesians chapter 1, and we're still in Ephesians chapter 1, of course, that in the dispensation, verse 10, we're just going on from verse 9. Of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. His plan and his will is to bring everything that has been brought through the work of Christ together at one time. There's going to be an awesome coming together in that day. And uh, we, we, the simplicity of God's plan is is something that you almost got to be, you know, working hard at to complicate because it is a very simple thing. He loves us. He made a way for us to be a part of his kingdom. He said he's coming back again to receive us unto himself, and we're going to be with him eternally. That's the simplicity of the gospel, and it's all through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you believe him, receive him, and don't deny him, he will not deny us before the Father and the heavenly angels. Isn't that what the Bible says emphatically and clearly? So we're, we're good with that. So uh, we're not going to confuse that. We're going to keep the simplicity of that message so that it, it brings and, and, and reiterates God's will in our lives on a regular basis. And let's, let's just read down through these next few verses, down through from verse 11 to verse 18. I like this particular portion of Scripture. And, uh, and uh, a lot of times we just like to pray it, you know, over, over the body of Christ. Uh, Let's just read down through for a bit. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the, the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom we, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation in whom also after ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And Paul goes on to talk about what he's praying. All right? And it's, 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 it's a suggestion, and uh, maybe we should consider praying this way for one another. Uh, let me read verse 16 so we can go on down into verse 17. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Isn't that a wonderful thing to pray for your brothers and for your sisters in Christ? That God might grant unto my brothers and unto my sisters the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. Amen. Wisdom and revelation. God's wisdom is so great. And that revelation that can only come from the spirit of God the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and given him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and in all. Do you know God's intention is that, that Jesus would be magnified in the church. And if you just look at that, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but the, the, the awesomeness of what has been done when when that power that raised Jesus from the dead begins to work in, in the body of Christ. The awesomeness of this, when you see it here, and it put all things under his feet and given him to be the head over all things to the church. Talking about Jesus being the head over all things to the church. To the church, which is his body, which is his body, the fullness of him, that filleth all and in all. That's, that's, that's an awesome charge for the church, which is his body, the church, which is his body, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, that filleth all and in all. Do you realize that God wants to explode in his body in the earth? Do you realize, a lot of times people, you know, they, they don't realize that God wants to show up in them. He wants to show up in every one of his people. So that when you look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, and we're, we're talking love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith, you know, all these things... He wants to show up in the body of Christ in the earth so that, so that all of the fruit of the Spirit is showing in the church. The fullness of Him that fills all in all. Him who is omnipresent wants to manifest in, in a limited present people in the earth. The fullness of Him. The church, his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Can you imagine God wanting to show up in human bodies, human beings? Can you imagine him wanting to manifest himself and be seen and identified in the church through you, through me, through us? He wants to be identified, his fullness showing up in the church. 
That's why it's dangerous for the church to get careless and slack and say, you know, I really don't matter, you know, how I live and what I do. Yeah, it does matter because how you live in the earth demonstrates the fullness of God or not. The goodness of God or not. The love of God or not. The peace of God or not. The joy of God or not. The faith of God or not. Do you get the point? He wants to show himself strong in the earth through the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, I don't expect that we're going to fully and completely understand all of that this side of heaven. But I can see enough here that he wants to show up in his church. He wants to start showing up in your home. He wants to start showing up on the job. He wants to start showing up at the grocery store. He wants to start showing up when you entertain friends. He wants to start showing up in every area of your life so that it changes how you act and how you react. It changes the way you talk and the way you walk. If it doesn't change me, then did it get inside of me? It's like, it's like when you go to a doctor, the doctor sometimes will give you medicine that's supposed to help you. True word? If that don't get inside of you, it's not going to affect you. I mean, you bring the prescription home, put it up in the cupboard, and everybody will get it filled. Well, that was a great prescription that the, that the doctor gave me. It looks really pretty up there sitting on the shelf. <clears throat> but I didn't bother to get it filled because I didn't think it was really worth bothering with. Is it going to do you any good? No. It's not going to do what it, in, it was intended to do. It's not going to bring the results it was intended to bring because it did not get implemented in your life. You did not follow through on what was given you. And the same thing applies to the word of God. God wants us to take his word. I mean, when God spoke to Joshua, even under the old covenant, he said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. It'll not depart from you. And, and, and you'll meditate therein day and night so that you will be able to know what you're to do and that you'll follow through in what you're supposed to do. And when you do that, you will actually make your way prosperous. Because I'm going to bless you because you meditate. On the word day and night. You ought to read this thing, man. You ought to read this thing on a regular basis. You ought to boring. <clears throat> Those of us who have some confidence in the medical profession or drink down some gunk because the doctor says it's going to help you. I drank four liters of gunk the other day. It was the ugliest tasting thing ever, but the doctor said you got to drink this stuff. I drank every last drop of it in obedience to someone I put some confidence in, all right? But yet, God says, keep this thing in front of you. Meditate it day and night, day and night. Now, if you can watch six hours of television and you can't read 15 minutes of the word, you have a problem and you have a serious one. I'll tell you, you have a very serious one. You need deliverance, and you need to get some priorities straightened out. This thing needs to be getting inside of you, and if you get something else in there that was not supposed to get in, it's going to have its effect and influence as opposed to the word having its effect and influence. So, so God wants us to be the manifestation of, of the omnipresent God in the earth. The fullness of God. 
of him that filleth all in all. He wants the fullness of himself to show up in the church. I remember the first time I read this scripture and it popped out at me. And it was probably like a little over 20 years ago. And I thought, I cannot be seeing what I'm seeing here. He's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. In other words, Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. We are the body of Christ, and we are the fullness of him that fills all and in all. We are the fullness of the omnipresent God. Oh, that is awesome. I I can't fathom that. I don't, I don't know how to process that. I, I'm trying to, to say to you what I think he's saying. But, but, but for all intents and purposes, I really, I really can't see through this like, like I'd like to. Because right now, we're seeing through a glass darkly, according to 1 Corinthians 13. We're seeing through a glass darkly, but then face to face. But while we see through a glass darkly or dimly, we can still make an effort to Flow with what God is saying and make what God is saying work out in the earth because we are simply being sensitive and obedient to the word of God and letting that word get on the inside of us so that it can come on the outside of us so the whole world knows that we've been with Jesus. And people need to be able to take notice that we've been with him. People need to be able to hear and listen and realize we've been with him. People need to be able to see the difference in our lifestyles and acknowledge that we've been with him so that the fullness of God shows up in the church, in the earth. I have a little bit of a problem when the church would rather manifest the powers of darkness than the power of God. When we are more interested in looking like a world that is spiraling out of control than we are presenting the God of the universe in our everyday life. I have a little bit of a problem with the church so hung up on everything that is anti-Christ instead of getting hung up on what is for Christ. And I believe we need to evaluate our walk and evaluate our talk, evaluate where we stand and what we believe, and readjust things until God smiles and says, that's my children. That's my church. That's my representation in the earth. That's my ambassadors in this foreign country. Amen? Because the word says we are ambassadors for Christ. Does it not say that? And as, therefore, as ambassadors for Christ, we are actually representing him here today, wherever we go. I, I, I'm closing, but I want to say this. You know, if we are ambassadors for Christ, like in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul said that we are ambassadors for Christ. If that be the case, do you know, if, if, if a country was going to declare war on another country, you know the first thing they do? They pull out their ambassadors. Let's get them out of here. And I don't know if you read the book of Revelation or not. You should read it one of these days. All hell's going to break loose one of these days. I mean, God is going to break some seals blow some trumpets, and some things are going to happen in the earth. Before that happens, he's going to take his ambassadors out. And I believe we're going to leave here with a shout. Amen? You can read it yourself. First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. In other words, it ought to be a comfort to the church to know that he's coming back and we're going out and up to him. And we're ready for that day. Amen. We're ready for that day. Are you looking forward to that time? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, the Apostle John would say. Come now. But until he comes, until he comes, we're his body. And we're the fullness of him in the earth. And we want to be good representatives. Good representatives of him here. Amen. Amen. I'm going to stop there and uh, just encourage you to take advantage of the blessings that belong to you. They've been poured out. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And let's pray one for another that the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him would be granted to us. Let's pray for our brothers and sisters and believe that that spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him will, 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 will allow us to begin to see the glorious power that was manifested when Jesus rose from the dead and was set at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion. I mean, come on, that is exactly what God wants the church to get a revelation of. Until the glory of the Lord shows up in the church. And before Jesus comes, I believe that glory is going to manifest in ways we've never seen it before. And the world will be reminded that God is in the earth, in the church, in his people, showing up in this latter day. Bow your heads with me. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for the word that, that encourages us to press in and to, to move on closer to where you want us to be, to, to press in and move closer to what you've called us to be so that the world can, can look and see what you've done, so that the world can look and be reminded that you have done great things whereof we are glad. And it brings joy and laughter into our hearts, into our lives, because the blessing of God belongs to us and is showing up in us. And the darkness and the gross darkness that has covered the earth has no effect or influence on us because the light of God has arisen upon his people. And we receive that light. We receive that enlightenment today, Father. And we pray that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Knowing that you've called us out of darkness into light, out of bondage into liberty. You've translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. And we thank you that the hope of glory stems from the fact that you are in us, Christ in us, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the grace and the goodness and the mercy and the peace and the joy and the righteousness that comes because of your kingdom. We receive that. We receive that right now. While we're still bowed before the Lord, just, just take a moment and be thankful to the Lord that he has done great things in your life. Sometimes your, your life can crowd out what the goodness of God has manifested for you. But even now, just smile and say, Father, I'm, I'm so thankful. I'm not where I used to be. I may not be where I'm supposed to be yet, but I'm headed in that direction. But I'm not where I used to be. And I've come a long way because of your grace and goodness in my life. And I'm not, not finished yet. And you're not finished in my life yet. Greater things are coming. Greater things are coming. And we receive that. We receive that. We receive the blessing of the Lord that maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. We receive that into our hearts, into our lives, into our minds, into our households, into our families, into our businesses. 
We expect and anticipate the glory of the Lord to show up in great and wonderful ways that will help the world to see that Jesus Christ is Lord.